I honestly thought I'd done this, a video covering the basics of resin printing, but since putting that video out, I've had so many comments from people asking me to make a video which explains the overall process to someone who has absolutely no idea what this journey entails. And it turns out, it's a lot. And since I've got a channel dedicated to helping you save money and make the best buying choices in this hobby, then it would help to start with a video that covers the highlights of what you're in for if you decide to start looking down the avenue of resin printing. But knowing what I know, I'm now worried I'm far too far from that position to relate to someone with the questions that people may have. So I need someone who's more of a beginner to give me a point of reference. So hi, I'm Ross, and this is Fohammer Videos. It's you! If you don't know Guy or his channel Midwinter Minis, that's okay. Not all 3D printer users are into miniatures and tabletop board games. But I hope you can support me in helping him out to grow his subscribers. Maybe check out some of his content, including his take on the experience of resin printing with good results for the first time. But don't do it yet. Hang on, I've got a whole video for you. You can watch that at the end of this. There's a link down in the description. For you, let's explain how you can go from what is resin printing to a pro printer with excellent results in the shortest time possible and what you're about to get yourself into. So Guy has already 3D printed before on his own and as he explains it himself, he tried it on the original Anycubic Photon, couldn't get it to work bar one single successful print and got so fed up with the process, gave that printer away and hasn't looked back since. But as we've come a long way from those days and 3D printing is making huge impacts on the modeling industry, it was time to try again. So I took a trip to sunny Colchester in January to visit Guy and help him walk through the process of getting amazing results on his printer every time. And what do you mean? I'm British, this is sunny to us. Anytime it's not raining, we call that sunny. Anyway, let's briefly explain the process of resin printing. These machines are designed to create far more detailed models than plastic melting FDM printers. And as a brief comparison of the two approaches, FDM printing has significantly more settings to play with, but thankfully now most printers with simple materials like PLA are at least workable with the settings out of the box. But for perfect results on a particular FDM printer with a particular material, you could spend months learning and tweaking a printer, and even after this you'll never get small details as sharp as with resin prints. It's just not possible. If you're looking for detail on par with store-bought plastic war games models or something of equivalent detail in whatever it is you want to print, it's not even close between the two technologies. Now on the flip side, resin printing is much easier and faster to dial in all the settings and get amazing and perfect results for your machine and resin combo. But the whole process of working with resin is far messier. And this is mostly because once your models are printed, you then need to do a whole cleaning and curing process to remove any residual resin and harden the shell. Throughout this, you must not touch the liquid resin with bare hands because it's toxic as are many of the chemicals you use to clean the models with. But moving on, here's what they do. Both types of printer, meaning FDM and resin, take digitally sculpted 3D model files from a computer and render them as physical objects. And to do this, you typically need to use an application referred to as a slicer. For resin, popular applications for computers include Chittubox and Lychee. Both of these apps have free versions with pro upgrade features, but most people will be absolutely fine with the free versions. You may already be wondering which is the best of these two apps, and well, the truth is, they're each better at different things. I'm not going to go into detail why here, because well, I've already covered it on a supporting prints video, and if you want more info, then check that out after watching this. But anyway, these slicer programs do exactly what the name suggests, they slice up your model into layers. So knowing that, I'm going to talk about resin printers exclusively going forward, and the file that these applications output is basically made up of a series of images in the resolution of your printer's screen, along with some code telling the printer how to expose these layers. And so you can understand how a load of flat images make up a 3D model, well, imagine a vegetable. If you slice it up with a knife, then look at the profile of one slice, each sliced part is essentially one resin print layer of the whole piece. You fuse those parts together and you have the shape of the object. Now obviously with a 3D printer, the slicers are much, much thinner. So yeah, that's exactly what the slicer programs are doing. They're splitting the object down into thin layers and your model is printed by curing resin in those shapes one layer at a time. This is by using types of resin that cure and harden when exposed to UV light. 
In a printer, that light is shone up through an LCD from a light source below it. There are various types of light source and the technology is ever evolving to ensure we get an even and direct spread of light projected up through the LCD. And above this LCD is a vat to store your liquid resin in. And this has a clear film on the base, it's called a release film, and like the LCD, this release film allows UV light to be projected through it. There are different types of films such as FEP, PFA, NFEP, ACF, but I cover the different material types and what they do in individual printer reviews. You really don't need to worry about that yet. Now in order to print a model, you transfer a file that's created from the slicer program to the printer, and that's usually via a USB drive, but a few printers now have a Wi-Fi transfer option. And an important note, because it may stump many of you, most USB drives that you get with printers are absolutely awful and can cause issues like print fails or even lock up a whole printer. So it's usually worth investing in a drive from a more reliable brand with any new printer purchase. Now when you tell your printer to print this file, it will start to create the model layer by layer. The build plate will lower into the vat and leave a very thin gap between the build plate surface and the release film below it. This gap is determined by your chosen layer height in microns or hundredths of a millimeter and is consistent throughout the print. And the layer height setting is often down to personal preference. It's a balance between quality at the smallest layer heights and time at the largest layer heights. Also, the more layers you have in a print, it normally means the longer your LCD will be on for. And that also has an impact on its longevity. You see, the LCDs are classed as consumable parts and may need replacing after about 2000 hours of exposure time. And that's the amount of time that the LCD is on for, not the whole printing time. The exposure time of the time during a print is eclipsed by the print bed raising and lowering. That takes the most time in any print. Now, as I was saying, when the print bed lowers, it leaves this gap determined by your layer height and the LCD will then display a monochrome image for the layer it's printing whilst the UV light is shone up from below. The dark areas of the screen mask out the light and the open areas of the screen allow the UV light through and the UV light can only cure the resin in the shape which is rendered as open on the LCD and to the height which is limited by the print bed or earlier resin layer above it. Now at that point after a layer is cured, it is fused to both the bed or previous layer and the release film. And just a quick aside, and I'm sorry to do this, but all of this is when you're using an LCD printer, which is referred to as masked stereolithography apparatus or MSLA. You also have more traditional SLA, which uses lasers, and you've got DLP printers, which use projectors instead of LCD panels. But due to the price of those hardware components, these types of printers are much rarer and everybody uses LCD and your models technically print upside down from how you viewed it in the slicer because of the way the bed lowers into the liquid resin rather than something being printed up from a bed. Anyway, back to what I was saying. When each layer is cured, the print bed then lifts out of the vat and that layer should pull away from the released film. Sometimes you will get an audible pop as the plastic slaps back down into place. And release films aren't solid, they are stretchy, so you will need to lift it by several millimeters for the resin to fully detach. And for printers with a larger print area, you'll need to lift the plate higher than with smaller printers due to the extra stretch in the larger film. I talk more about this lift height and various other settings in my how to print video, and I'll go into more detail in a future video too. For now, this is just to know how it all works. And on that, one thing to know is that your base layers, meaning your first few layers, need to be cured for longer than normal layers because they need stronger adherence to the plate. And it's also worth understanding that because models print in this layer format, the lowest points from every area on the model must be directly connected to the build plate with earlier resin layers or a lower part of the model beneath it. This is to avoid having what's called islands in your prints, because without anything to stick to below them, how would they be pulled away from the release film when the bed lifts? Thankfully, applications like Lychee Slicer have a feature to identify these islands before you print anything, but again, you want my supporting models video for more information on how all that works. So now you know how a single layer is made, the printer basically repeats this lower, cure, lift process until each of the layers of the model is done and you've got a completed object. Again, I want to stress, I don't want you to worry too much about the specific settings for now because it might be overwhelming, especially if you're brand new, but things like bed lifting speed and how long to wait after lowering into the bed can all affect both the print speed and quality, or it can cause the print to fail altogether. 
Again though, that's what my settings video is for and that's already in place and that'll walk you through a process to absolutely nail all of that. But now you understand how resin printing works and despite perhaps not having hands-on experience, you're probably a good way up to speed with as much as Guy knew before I turned up at his house. Now Guy has the Uniformation GK2, which is an incredible 3D printer. In fact, it's the best all-round 3D printer on the market right now. Though it may be a little much on the expensive side for most people, I don't know what your budget is and I'm not here to judge, but this printer has one key feature amongst its many convenience features which helps us no end, and that is a chamber heater. And one thing you need to know is that resin temperature plays a role in resin printing. You see, when resin's warm, it cures faster, and depending on your resin, there is an optimal range, which is normally above 20 degrees Celsius and mid-20s ideally. You can cure resin in lower temperatures, so don't worry, but you'll need to cure it for longer, which often results in overexposed bloated prints, but it's only a little bit or the results are that you get more brittle resin when it's fully cured. The impact will vary depending on just how cold your temperature is, and this isn't a huge difference. I'm just letting you know that unless you have optimal temperatures, you won't get the most optimal results. Where this actually does become an issue is if you've got variable temperatures. If you start a print when it's nice and warm and leave it overnight, you might come back to a failure the next morning due to a temperature drop in the middle of the process. Now the GK2 comes equipped with a heater to combat this, but there are other options which I'll show you in my video where I tested the GK2 heater by printing outside in the snow. And more and more companies are coming out with chamber heaters now or vat belts, or you can put your printer in a hydroponics grow tent. There are loads of options to keep your printer warm. This printer just has the feature built in, which is incredibly helpful. But what this does mean is I knew the environment temperature that Guy was using because this printer controls it. So this is one of few situations where I can just give him the best settings because I've got the same printer and resin and temperature combo as him. But if you can't control your temperature, then the fact is you can't just copy someone else's settings, even if you use the same printer and same resin together. You will need to do exposure tests to dial in your printer, so once again I'll refer you back to my video on how to configure a printer, and this is what I walk Guy through in case he ever wants to change his resin to another brand or use a different printer. And what I also did and will do for you is I gave him a detailed rundown of what all the different slicer settings do. And like I said, I'll do that for you, but that's going to be in a future, future video. So now with his printer set up and all the settings ready, it was about lunchtime. So we started off with prints and I went out to check in my hotel. Now at this point, I've just realized that I'm not actually halfway through my script and we still have lots to go over in regard to the process. So let's take a break here, just as I actually did in real life, by having a quick trip around Colchester town. But stick with me to the end because I've got an important question for you and this really needs answering. Now, whilst I was out, I popped into the local Warhammer store, as I love to do when visiting a new place that has one, and to my surprise, they actually had models by Guy and Hattie in the window, and that's really cool. But I also spotted some incredibly well-painted Blood Angels in the store window too, and if anyone knows who painted these, let me know so I can add their name in the video description. These are some gorgeous, like, almost heavy metal standard marines, and that's not the question that I wanted to ask. Another thing I did, I want to point this out because it was awesome. On the way back, I nipped into a new place called the Sushi Co or the Sushi Company, which had just opened two weeks before my visit and I love me some sushi. And the presentation of the dishes was incredible. I'm not getting paid by them for promotion. I didn't get a free meal. I just thought it was a cool place and I had my new camera and wanted to shoot it while I was there. And yeah, it tasted great too. So check them out if you like sushi. I hope they bring one to Nottingham very soon. So anyway, as I said, we'd left the printer running and I went back to Guy's house that evening for a game of Hero Quest with Ant and Golden Demon winner Steve, who've actually been on the Midwinter Minis channel several times before. And it was all good until this moment. He snuck into the room just to do that action and then he was going to leave again. Let him take his... No! Yeah. No! No! Let him... So can I just point out, Guy's completely changed his tune from the move I was just... He was like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, I didn't know. But yeah, now that he's on camera, totally different. <laughs> so you see, I've always believed when playing Hero Quest, if you search for treasure in a room which has a special treasure, like a chest or weapon rack, the first person in the room to search gets that treasure. 
Now, Guy's argument was, as his character used Pass Through Rock, that you must be adjacent to said box or rack in order to claim it. Now, I'd like to hear your comments below this video, who was right here? Sorry, anyway, what was this video about? Yes, 3D printing. Okay, let's get back to it. Ooh, squirrel. Sorry, you know I'm easily distracted. Right, anyway, thank you for sticking with me through those like blatant ads that aren't ads. It was just a cool part of the experience. Next time, I'm gonna be covering the post-processing stage of 3D printing and what it takes to get models from the warm liquid goo phase to usable on your desk. Make sure you're subscribed and look out for that coming next. Thanks to our members for helping us make this content and to Guy for being an excellent host and puppet for my video content. It's certainly a pleasure to feature on a channel as renowned as his. So until next time, what's this? What's this? There's magic in the air. Fohammer out.